Okay, we're going to pick up right where we left off last time. The topic is cache memory. And remember the idea? What is cache size-wise compared to main memory? Is it larger or smaller? It's smaller. And what about speed-wise? Faster. So the whole idea is that you put a cache, which is smaller but faster than main memory, in between memory and the CPU. And then what happens is, it's like a, kind of like a hash table. You, when you request, when the CPU requests an item from memory, it first checks to see if it has already been prefetched in the cache. And if it has been prefetched in the cache, it just gets it from the cache and we don't have to go over the system bus and waste all those cycles. So, every, but if it's not, then that's a cache miss and then we have to wait after all. But, but what we do is we take memory in really big chunks. We prefetch, hoping that, um, that the next time we need to do a memory access, the, memory will, the data will already be, have been prefetched in, in the cache. And then we were looking at the end of class last time, we were looking at figure 12.28, which is a diagram of what is called a direct mapped cache. And now, um, what we're going to do now is, let's take a look. Um, we're going to do two examples with this. And uh, we're going to put up a little, a, a little bit more detail of the actual organization of the cache. Um, at the end of class last time, or during class last time, we, we, we did an example. We said, suppose that the CPU requests data from location 19. So here, here's an example. And suppose that we did load word accumulator 19 direct. So what we want is a word from the accumulator 19 direct. OK? So, um, so now, here's, so, so what, what we, the CPU wants memory from what location? address 19. Now in PEP9, addresses are all 16 bits. So first thing we do is we see that 19 decimal, and I, I think we worked this out last time, it's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. Right? Is that, I think we figured out that this was 19. So this is what the CPU sends to the, to the memory subsystem. And, it, and in, it's, the cache is invisible to the CPU, but then the cache subsystem delivers. And so what does the cache subsystem do? What it does in this particular example in figure 12.28 is it divides the first nine bits of the requested address and it uses that as what's called the tag field. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So from here to here is the tag field. The next three bits are the line field. So three bits for the line field. And then the next four bits are called the byte field. So, so the cache subsystem divides the address into these fields. And then what it does, and now, these three bits here, the line field, these three bits are the address of the entry in the cache. The cache has eight entries. There's a cache sub zero, a cache sub one, a sub two, a sub three, sub four, sub five, sub six, and sub seven. All right? And what this, what this means is that, what this 001 means is that, is that the, the cache subsystem is going to go to entry 1. It's the second line there. All right. So now, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's draw a more detailed version of the cache. Okay, down here. So look, we're going to do the first four lines of the cache. And we'll do dot, dot, dot. Okay? 
Now, so the cache has, um, oh, and so this is cache sub zero, sub one, sub two, sub three, etc., down to seven. Are you with me? And then each one of these entries has, what's this first field called? Valid. Valid. That's the valid field, and that's just one bit. And then there's a tag field, so the tag field is three bits. So here's tag. And now what we're going to do in a little bit more detail here is the next part of the cache entry, each, the next part of the cache entry is called what? It's called data. And what did we see last time? How many, how much, how, so this is one bit, this is another, this is three bits. How many bytes are in the data field? Do you remember? According to this picture, how many bytes? Two. Nope. Uh, 16. 16. So here, this is going to be, this is 8, right? So 16 would be this. Right? Now, so this is 1 bit, this is 3 bits, each one of these is 8 bits. Are you with me? 8 bits? Yeah. This, the, there's 1 bit in the valid field, 3 bits in the tag field, there's 8 bits bits in each one of these because each one of these is a byte. Are you with me? It's 16 bytes. Notice it's 16 bytes. This field, there's 16 bytes in this field. Is everybody clear on that? So look, so what happens, here's the, here's, what, here's the way the cache subsystem works. What happens is it looks at the, oh and by the way, when this is initialized, all these valid field, all these are set to, all these are set to zero because nothing has been prefetched yet. So the way the cache subsystem works is it looks at 0, 0, 0, 1, right? And so that is entry 1. It goes to entry 1 and it says, ah, there's a 0 there. That means there's no valid information here. So that means it's a cache miss. And so what does it do? Now we have to wait. We have no choice. We haven't done any prefetching. So now we have to wait and until memory will deliver us 16 bytes. Are you with me? And, and when it delivers those 16 bytes, what, what, will, it, what will the cache subsystem do? It will take this uh, tag field, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and it will put that tag field here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that's the tag field. Are you with me? And then it will pre, and then all 16 bytes will be here. Now, which, what is it going to deliver to the CPU? Where, where is the field that is going to deliver to the CPU? This is zero zero one one. So now, what number, what number is zero zero one one? That's three. So it's. 0, 1, 2, 3. So it's going to deliver, it's, it's going to, no, my pen is running out of ink here. Actually, because it's a word, it's going to be do this one and the one next to it. But anyway, let's, let's say, yeah. Are you with me? This is, so all of these are going to be filled. It's going to deliver this to the CPU. Do you see why this is the byte field within this, within this big data field? It's 0, 1, 2, 3. There's 3. See, there's 16. There's 16 cells. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way up to 15. And, this, and, so this is, and so it delivers this, but now the rest of these are all filled. And then hopefully, the next time the CPU asks for something at memory location, like suppose, here, if, suppose we do um, load word accumulator 3519 direct that's 3519 so what does the system have to do it has to calculate 3519 decimal and if you work that all out, if you, fig if you do calculate that all out, it turns out to be this number in binary. Here, let's make this load byte accumulator. Okay, so then what will the, what will the cache subsystem do in this case? 
it will divide this in the first nine bits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So they'll be here. The tag field, sorry, the line, so this is the tag field. The line field will be here and the byte field will be here. So base, and so it'll go down to what row? Now, so now it'll go down to what row in the, in the cache? Three, yes, sub three, the fourth row. So it'll come down to here. Oh, oh, oh and by the way, uh, we forgot to do one thing. Once it fills this in, it sets this valid bit now to one. So now it knows, so now it'll check to see if there's something in that cache field, see. Okay, so now it comes out here, it's a zero, oh, okay, so therefore it, we, have to, we have to go to memory again. Only this time what it'll do is when it reads those 16 bytes from memory, when it gets them and it puts them in the cache, it puts them at, it, it, it installs the tag field, 0000, zero, zero, zero. so 0000, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. One one zero one one, all right, and it goes down here to one 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 one. So it will deliver to the cache. Sorry, the cache will deliver to the CPU this byte, but all of these will be filled in the meantime, and it will set this to one so that the next time it goes, and it has to fetch something that would be prefetched into this line, it can. Yeah, question. It's so that the cache subsystem will know that something is in there. When you first boot up your computer and the cache is empty, there's random values would be in there. In all of those tag fields. Oh, no, 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 no. In all of these fields. So when you first boot up your computer, the CPU, the very first thing that the CPU does on startup is on all of its caches, it sets the valid fields to all zero. But then as before the cache is filling up, the system needs to know whether these val values that are, are in here are valid. But that, those valid bits have to be set to zero on power up when the CPU powers up the first time. That's part, that's part of the power up routine that, that has to happen. And then the tag is just saying where it... No, where it... Ca ah, now, good question. Now, what about this tag? So look, you guys, here's the thing. What did we say the size of the cache was compared to the size of memory? Smaller. Smaller. That means that more than one region of memory will map to the same what? Same what? Same, uh, cache same cache entry, yeah. Are you with me? So how do you know where in memory it came from? How does the cache subsystem know where in memory it came from? Like, if, if, um, beca and here on this figure, notice that the 16 bytes starting at zero will go into cache sub zero. The 16 bytes beginning at 16 will go into the, into the sub one, you know, the second entry. And the one starting at 32 will go into sub three, uh, sorry, sub two. Are you with me? But it's also the case that the ones that begin at 128 will, will also be mapped to sub zero. And from 144 will also be mapped to sub one. And from uh, 160 will also be mapped to sub two. So just because you have an entry here, how do you know which one of those possibilities it came from? That's why you need the tag field. Yeah, only it's not just three, it's dot, dot, dot. Right, so here, so here is the operation, here's the operation of the cache. It extracts the line field from the CPU memory address request. Retrieve the valid tag data cache entry from the line row. If valid equals equals zero, it's a cache miss, and you have to do a memory fetch, like we just saw the scenario here. Else if the tag, else, okay, so now else if, so now else, just because it's one, doesn't mean that it's a hit, because this has to match do you see how, what we're saying there? So else if the tag from the cache is not equal to the tag from the memory request, that's also a cache miss. Now of course it doesn't do this sequentially, it does, them concurrent, it does these tests concurrently. It doesn't like do this, wait, and then do this. You know, but this is the logic, right? Else it's a cache hit, 
and you can use the data field and then what you, else it's a hit and if it's a hit you can just take this part and just go to that part in the cache and boom there it is. Now does everybody see how that works? So what happens then is suppose, suppose you have pre-filled this uh, sub 3, this cache sub 3 line here and the CPU requests um, information from another part of memory that would also map to this. Then even though this is valid, if the tag fields don't match, this has to be wiped out and be replaced with the, with the it's a miss and it has to be wiped out. Now what does that correspond to in a, in, in a, in a hash table? That corresponds to a what? To a collision. Where two keys map to the same one. Because two memory lines can map to the same entry of the cache. So this is just like a hash table. It's like a collision in a hash table. Now, in this particular case, how, did, how are collisions handled? In this direct mapped cache, how are collisions handled? Well, the one that collides simply does what? Replaces. Do you see what I mean? It just simply, the other one goes away and it replaces it. And if, if the CPU needs something from the one that went away, well that would be a miss again and then it would be replaced again. Okay? Now do you see a problem with this? Do you see what? Yeah, if you, if you, yeah, if you just happen to have two, you know, some, some address, some requests that, that, that they both map to the same thing and then, oh you, it's Murphy's Law, you know. If something bad happens, it will. And there are cases where, like, you know, like if you go to, like maybe the heap is in one place of memory and the stack is in another place in memory and you're doing the heap and the stack and the heap and the stack and, and, there, and you get the, you could, you know, it could very well happen. So it is possible to get a pattern of requests that result in a high cache miss rate. The program switches back and forth between the low region of memory and the high region of memory that map to the same cache entry. And you know, here's an example of uh, pointers and things like that in the PEP9. So you guys, how did we handle collisions with a hash table? Do you remember how we handled collisions with a hash table? You know, what, 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 what happened if we had, if we had, what was the, the way that we resolved collisions with a hash table in software? Yeah, we just but we, we just made more entries, and f the entries were what in the, in our software in our software solution. The entries were what? They're entries in a what? No, not an array. The array was the ha the hash table itself was the array. But if they co if they collided, if we had, if if we wanted to store two keys that hashed to the same entry in the array, it was a linked list. Yeah, you're right. It was, and those are called chains that we hashed with chaining. Now here's the thing. With a chain in software, we could always just tack on an extra one. In hardware, you can't just, just you know, have an arbitrary, it would be very difficult to just have an arbitrary number. So, but we can do the next best thing. Instead of having just one entry, see, let's, let's go back here to figure 12.28. Um, instead of just having one entry in each cache, instead of having just one tag and data entry in the cache entry, we could do what? Instead of having just one, we could have what? We could have several. And that's the idea behind a set associative cache. With a set associative cache, the cache hit rate increases because you have more than one possible entry. So each cache entry can hold several lines of data from memory. And so the example that we're going to give is a cache that can store up to four lines of data in each cache entry. So that would be called a four-way set associative cache. And there are like eight-way set associative caches. There are two-way set associative caches. Okay, so that's what, that's what the way means in an n-way associative cache. So here is, so let's go back to our figure 12.28. Um, now what does each entry have in figure 12.28? What does each entry in the cache have? It ha has a what? A valid, a tag, and a data. So now what are we going to do here in figure 12.30? There is a valid tag data 
and yet another valid tag data, and yet another valid tag data, and yet another valid tag data. So each one of these is like an individual entry. So each, are you with me? Is everybody clear on how this works? And so now what happens is, when the, if the CPU makes a memory request, it'll take the tag field and it will go, and now it checks, now it has to check what? All the what? All the valid bits. And the ones, and the, the valid bits that are one, it would, it would check the what? the tag field and if it and if that was a hit and that's how it would determine whether it was a hit or not and if it was a hit it would take the data from that are you with me so everybody see how this uh, set four-way set associative cache works and now you guys here comes something that's really cool at this point in our digital design circuit design computer organization abilities. Here in figure 12.30 is the read circuit for this four-way set associative cache and I think you can I think we can understand every single logic gate in here because this is a circuit that does all of that in hardware at once simultaneously. This is hardware concurrent processing. It doesn't have to like look at the first one, then look at the second one, then look at the third one, then look at the fourth one. So let's see if we can decipher this. Figure 12.30 together. Come, let us reason together. <laughs> Are you ready? So check this out. You see at the very top is the address that's produced by the CPU. It's the address request. It's the operand specifier. Are you with me? And so what the cache subsystem does is it divides it into the tag field, nine bits, the three bit line, uh, line field, and then it, ha and it has the byte field, right? And now you understand this cache storage box, the second box down that, start, that has cache address at the top and cache data at the bottom, you understand that that is this figure, tw this first part of figure 12.30. Do you see what I mean? In other words, it's these four, it's these, it's, it's the whole cache and there's a valid tag and data replicated four times for each entry. So this whole box in figure 12.30, first part of figure 12.30 is this top box, this cache storage, right? Are you with me? So what do we have coming in for the what do we have coming in from the line field on the top here? We have three lines. Have we done this? Yeah, we've done the slash notation before, right? The slash three means three lines. So that's three tag lines. And notice that the slash nine coming from the tag field, that means that, that, that that's actually nine wires. So that wire coming down from line to, to the cache editor, that's three. Okay, so what is that three? Do you see, do you see what, is, what are those three lines doing that are coming into the cache address? If we come back here, what they're doing is that's selecting one of the rows. Are you with me? That's selecting one of those rows. So one of those rows is being presented to the output. And what, and what are those rows? A valid tag data, valid tag data, valid tag data, and valid tag, da tag data. So you see, if we come back here to figure 12.30, the second part, you see that's the valid V tag data, V tag data, V tag data, V tag data. So that's being presented. That putting those, th those three bits of the cache address to the cache presents those. This is like a, you know what, this is like a register bank only instead of having a two-port register bank with A and B, it's a what? It's like a four-port, you know. Or actually, I take that back. It's a one-port, after all. It's just, there's a lot of them. It's just that the, the bit size is really wide. Are you with me? So then, those nine lines that are coming from the tag field are going into, now what is this circle with an equals? What do you suppose that is? 
That's a comparator. Do you remember in the lab we did a lab with comparators? And do you remember there was an A less than B and an A equals B and an A greater than B output for a comparator? So that's just a comparator whose output is one if what? If they're equal. And now, and so what is it comparing? It's comparing the tag field from the address with the tag field from the cache. Four of them, all at the same time. Are you with me? So here, this equals here on the, on the far right. It's comparing the tag field from the address that's submitted by the CPU, the address request. It's comparing that with the tag field that's in this part of the, of the associative cache. Does everybody see how that, how that works? And now, if this is equal, then what will the output, then the input of this AND gate will be what? If these are equal, if, those, if that tag field equals that tag field, then the, then the input, the right input of this AND gate will be what? One. And that AND gate acts as a what? As an enable. So if it is one, then what else will flow through on the left? The V bit. So if the V bit is one and the tag fields are equal, then what will happen? That goes down to a what? Hit. To the hit. So if any one of those is equal, then what? We've got a hit. So there it is. There's the hardware computation of whether you got a hit in a four-way set associative cache. Is that slick? Mm, well, hit is going to be one if there's a cache hit and zero if there's a cache miss. And it's doing that all simultaneously in the hardware, concurrently. I mean, it's doing all four concurrently in the hardware. Do you see how that works? So the output of this cache subsystem, you can tell right away whether or not there's a hit or a miss. And if there is a hit, if there is a hit, then what? Then these multiplexers, 120, why, is there a, why are there 128 four input multiplexers? Why 128? Where did that 128 come from? Well here, let's come back to this direct mapped cache. How many bits are in one whole line here? What did we say? How many bits were here? Now, yeah, okay. So now, why are there 128 four input multiplexers? Because each data, each part of the data has 128 bits. And why 128 bits? Because we said there were 16 bytes in a line, and 16 times 8 is 128. Does everybody see how that works? And so there you have it, the read circuit. Now, there's lots of issues that come up here with, this, with these um, set associative caches. Because eventually what's going to, so, so what happens is when, it's, when you start up, the valid bits of all, f of, of the whole thing, here let's go back to this. The valid bits are all, are all zeros. You get a cache miss, you fill up one of those, you, you, then you get another collision, but you, there's room for a, third, a second one, you get another collision, but there's room for a third one, there's a, you get another collision, there's room for a fourth one. But now what might eventually happen? What will eventually happen? You'll get a fifth collision. So now if you get a fifth collision, what do you have to decide? Yeah, you have to decide how to replace. And there are various so if a cache miss occurs and all parts of the cache are filled, which one is overwritten by the new data? And there's several different possibilities. Least recently used, okay, requires only one bit per entry with a two-way set associative cache. A four-way four set associative cache is kind of hard to do in hardware actually. Um, and so it's common to use an approximation of the least recently used. But least recently used is very, is, or an approximation to it is usually what, the, way they, the way they do it. And then somebody asked last time um, about this next question. Everything that we've done so far has been with load word or load byte accumulator. And that's memory what? Memory read or memory write? That's a memory read. But what happens if you do a store? That's a memory write. And so the question is, 
what's the policy with a memory write? So we have cache, and there's two possibilities. You could either have a hit or a miss. Are you with me? So now there's, <laughs> this is interesting. There's, so you've got all these different possibilities. So a cache write, first of all, a cache write policy with a cache hit. Now if there's a hit, that means that you want to write to memory, but there's a hit. So, th so the, the copy of the memory is in the cache. Now can you think of the two different, what are the two different possibilities? You either do what? Yeah, yeah, well you, you for sure overwrite it in the cache. But the question is if you do what? I mean if you do a cache, if, there's, if it's a cache hit, if you do a, a memory write with a cache hit, you know you've got to replace the, the hit in the, you, you, know, you know you have to replace it in the, co in the, in the cache because the next time, you're gonna, you, next time you get from the cache you want to get the updated version, right? Yeah, whether or not to update the memory. So with write through, you just write it to the cache and you also write it to memory. But now you see, since you wrote it to the cache, then it can be, do you see that it could be writing to memory and not slow the CPU down? Do you see what I mean? It could, and so all those extra cycles that it takes to write, to go, to, to send, to update the memory can be going, that doesn't slow the CPU down. Are you with me? So every write request updates the cache and the corresponding block in memory. With write back though, you don't bother to do that. You just keep, you just keep the updated version in cache. Boom, 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 read, write, read, write, read, write. And then finally, when do you have to update memory in that case? Yeah, when that's replaced. And so, that, so that's a little bit faster, but on the other hand, it's slower when it needs to be replaced because you see what I mean? You, if, if, you, if you do write through, you are anticipating that it's going to have to be written anyway. And so if you have to discard it, you can just discard it and you don't have to write through. So it's, you know, pay now or pay later. So this is the installment plan. You know, you either write now, take your lumps, you know, while you can or later. And it depends on the pattern, you know, there's no, no clear winner. Both of these are common. And here's a picture. So um, in figure 12.31. So um, on part A on the left, that's right through. So what we have is each time, each time you do a write, the CPU um, with write through, the CPU simply writes to this cache and then the cache write, updates it to memory. And then when it's replaced, the only thing you have to do is just replace from memory. You see in the bottom part of part A in figure 12.31. On the other hand, with write back, what you do is each time you do a write, you only update the cache. But then when it's replaced, you have to do this extra step. So you have to do it late, you have to fix it up later when it's replaced. Yeah. No, it's not, that's a good question. The question is, isn't write through always better, <coughs> always better than write back? And the answer is no. But it's complicated because it depends. It depends on the pattern. It depends on the access on the pattern of requests. It can be in some situations one is better than the other. Because what happens is with write through what happens is there's lots of bus traffic. You would be writing unnecessarily with write through. There's lots of bus traffic, you see? There's but because every time you write to memory there's a it goes over the the system bus gets congested. See? But on the other hand, if you do write through, then whenever, the, then whenever you, it needs to be replaced, it's fast. So it's you either pay now or pay later. No, 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 it does not. The CPU to, no, yeah, let's go back and, the question is, is CPU to cache the same as cache to memory? Here, let's go back and look at this. Yeah, hold on, let's, let's clarify one thing. In figure 12.27, you see the system bus is down here at the bottom. So that's different. So the path between the, between the system bus and the cache is different from the, path, from the path between the cache and main memory or the cache and another lower level cache. Actually, here, actually there's, a couple of, there's a couple of slides here that will show advantages and disadvantages of each. So with write through, the design is simpler. 
when a cache line is replaced, memory always has the latest update. And, but excessive bus traffic can reduce performance of other devices using the bus. So that's the, that's the disadvantage. Okay. On the other hand, with write back, that has better performance of other devices using the bus, especially when you get a burst of write requests. Because if you get a whole burst of write requests, like if you're in a loop and you're updating an array or something, the whole array is in the cache, you're just boom, 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 you're write, 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 and then, and then when it gets replaced, that's when you have to go to memory. But there is a delay when the cache line must be replaced because memory must be updated before a new data can be loaded into the cache. So see, it depends on the pattern. And then engineers, hardware engineers, they simulate this stuff and they do it under reasonable, you know, they see which patterns occur most often and they trade, trade they, they make their trade-offs that way, yeah. Does the delay increase? Yes, the, the thing, yeah, the quite, yeah, it's directly related to the hit, to the hit ratio. So the higher the hit ratio, the, the higher the hit ratio, the more disadvantage right through is. Do you see why? Okay. Well, and that's just half of the that's just half of the problem. The other half of the problem is what about cache write policies with cache misses? Do you see you see what I mean? So now suppose you, you do a store word accumulator, and you do store word accumulator, but, and there's not even an entry in there in the first place. Are you with me? So that's a whole other scenario. Are you with me? So this is called, the, 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 the operative word here is right allocation. There's without right allocation, and there's with right allocation. Without right allocation, you bypass the cache altogether. So here's a picture. Figure 12.32.a. So it's a write miss, and the CPU, if you want to write to memory, oh, you just go ahead and write to memory. You don't bother updating the cache. But with write allocation, you say, oh, this is a cache miss. So you actually bring the line in from memory, and then you update the, you, and then you update the cache. And these things go together, A and B, for, write for without write allocation and with write allocation, they, always go with A and B of write through and write back. Okay, you can, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy to see why. So this, and by the way you guys, this whole thing that we've just talked about with caches, this whole thing is, is, happens all throughout com computer systems, all the way from the highest level software to the lowest level hardware. It's this classic, there are two extremes, small high speed memory and large low speed memory. And have you guys, has anybody here had the operating systems course? Did you take OS? Yeah, so do you remember virtual memory? It's the same thing. It's the same kind of thing. With virtual memory you have small fast main memory and a large slow disk. Okay. And that, so that's one hardware version. This is another hardware version of it. Cache with small fast register bank and a large slow main memory. And in software, it's like a hash table. What we have talked about in these, with these details is actually a more general, is a very general problem. And what we're going to do today is we're going to close with a concept that will get us started with... Um, a whole new kind, a whole new idea. Okay? And it is, this concept is part and parcel of what is called the system performance equation. Now, what is the main thing that the customer wants? You write an app, and what does your customer want? He wants speed, so that is what per what? That's time per what? Well, no, I mean, he, he, it's, it's an app. So what does the customer want? Small time per program. Executing the program, are you with me? Time per program. But the thing of it is, is that what determines the time per program? Well, it's 
depends on how many instructions of that program execute, right? So if you have a nice order big, big theta n log n program, you know, and we do statement execution counts and it's big theta n log n, then it's the total number of statements that execute that determines the, that determines the ex execution, execution time of the program, right? So it's instructions per program, but wait a minute. Each one of those instructions takes so many what? Cycles. So there's also cycles per instruction, but then there's also what? Time per cycle. Are you with me? So look, you guys remember how you did, do you guys remember how you did in science, in your science classes, especially physics and chemistry? How you would do dimensional analysis and you would divide, that the units cancel? You know how you do that? Okay, so here is the system performance equation. What it says is that the time per program, which is what the customer wants to minimize, right? time per program. It's the product of three quantities. The instructions that execute per program times the what? Cycles it takes per instruction and that's what we did in PEP9 CPU. Remember we counted up we had 18 and then we reduced down to 10 by increasing the database width so that's cycles per program, oh, sorry, cycles per instruction. And then you multiply that times what? Time per cycle. And so what happens is the instructions in the first cancel with the, in the numerator, cancels with the instructions of the second in the denominator, and the cycles in the second one, in the numerator of the second, cancels with the cycles in the denominator of the third, and you wind up with what? The time per program. So how do you minimize this? How do you minimize this whole thing? And what's interesting is there are three, <laughs> three of these things that we, can, that we can work with to try to minimize the whole thing. And what's interesting about this is that, look, the first two are, are inverse. Do you see what I mean? If you increase the first one, you can increase the first one by doing what? Decreasing, decreasing the second one. Decreasing. Or you could decrease or you know or you can increase the second one by decreasing the first one. Actually I said that the wrong way around. You're trying to decrease. So you can decrease the first, but if you do, you're liable to increase the second. You can decrease the second, but if you do, you're liable to what? You'll probably do what? Increase, increase the first. But the interesting thing is, is that the third one is independent of that. Right? The third one is independent. You, you, can, you can decrease the time per cycle regardless of how you made the trade-off between the first two. And this is going to lead us to a big topic tomorrow, which is reduced instruction set computers, risk chips. So see you then.